Okay, so I'm, uh, I'm Steve Fuller. I'm a professor of sociology at the University of Warwick. I hold a chair in social epistemology, which is a field that I'm closely associated with, which has to do with the social foundations of knowledge, understood from both an empirical and a normative perspective. That is to say, not only how knowledge has been and is being produced, but how it should be produced in the future. Um, and in terms of my interest in this topic, in terms of Humanity 2.0 and transhumanism, um, I should say that my original background is in history and philosophy of science. And there has been this general uh, tendency uh, to understand science as kind of the, uh, the vanguard social practice, as it were, for defining what humanity is. So in a sense, science projects our possible futures in many respects, and this is especially true with regard to issues of technology. And about five or six years ago now, I got involved in the European Union Framework Project on converging technologies. And this is the idea of nano, bio, info, and cogno sciences and technologies, possibly uh, working more closely together, in that sense converging, to provide a sort of transformed, indeed an enhanced notion of the human condition, what might be called Humanity 2.0. And it was at that point being involved in this project, which is uh, designed to influence science policy making uh, across the European continent, uh, that I started uh, thinking more widely about the philosophical implications of this kind of world that's being actively uh, promoted by science policy makers, and indeed not just in Europe but also in the United States. There's also a similar initiative there. Um, and, and this is what I mean by Humanity 2.0, and it's a broadly transhumanist agenda. And by transhumanist, uh, what I mean is taking the kinds of qualities that we regard as most distinctive of human beings, what separate us out the most from animals, whether we're talking about consciousness or rationality um, or you know any other sorts of, for the most part, though not entirely mental powers, uh, and amplifying them in some way, and in this sense enhancement, so to the possibility that we may in fact even be able to turn into or evolve into another species that is a, a kind of amplified or better version of what we are now. Uh, and this might be through biological or through some biotechnological or perhaps through a kind of technological self-transformation, sort of uploading as it were into a more silicon durable form. All of this I include in the in the concept of transhumanism and it's and it's largely what I uh, study and have been very interested in pursuing is Humanity 2.0. Okay, uh, let me say that, um, so last year I published this book, uh, Humanity 2.0, um, and that book, um, sort of a, a larger book, was very much concerned with um, kind of the way in which we have come to, be, come to see ourselves as human beings. And the point that I was emphasizing there from a historical standpoint is that being a human being is not something that is kind of given uh, as a sort of biological thing. So in other words, being a homo sapiens, as we are, doesn't necessarily mean we're human. In fact, uh, typically human being human has, regard, has involved being engaged in other kinds of activities. Uh, typically education has been the most important one, but of course there have been other sorts of ways in which we've sort of disciplined ourselves as biological creatures to become quote unquote more human. And so I look into the historical background of that um, and the sort of general philosophies guiding that, but I also look at the way in which this notion is being transformed uh, in, in the current period. And so I look at the role of the converging technologies agenda and what it would mean from a sort of moral and political standpoint uh, for us to be humanity 2.0. That is to say, a substantially different creature from the humanity 1.0 that, let's say, uh, is enshrined in the UN Declaration of Human Rights. I think for, for this Humanity 2.0 thing to be fully realized, um, there's a sense in which the kinds of priorities that are presupposed in the UN Declaration of Human Rights would have to change. Because one of the things that the UN uh, Declaration puts a great deal of emphasis on is on the integrity of the human body. And this is where the concept of dignity comes in. So uh, a lot of the prohibitions against torture, uh, you know, the issues of sanctity of life, have a lot to do with a kind of a, sort of uh, conception of there being a natural state of the human body. Um, it seems to me that transhumanism really, in a way, plays around with that assumption in very serious ways. 
Um, whether we're talking about this sort of uh, direct enhancements where people are actively encouraged, as it were, to experiment with their bodies in terms of possibly uh, developing new powers and things of that kind, perhaps, uh, let's say, having a genetic transformations that, which may involve uh, taking in what's called xenotransplantation, genetic material from other animals, other sources, uh, or also prosthetic extensions where in fact we're taking non-biological substances and making them part of the, uh, of the human being. Now all of those things which may be in fact become part of normal medical practice or may be part of self-experimentation um, seems to me then you know makes it very blurry uh, as it were when we are human and when we are something else and what counts as humane and inhumane treatment. I mean I think the uh, the, the spirit of the UN Declaration of Human Rights was basically to get all of humanity up to a certain kind of standard where people's bodies are in their kind of what, are, what is regarded as a kind of natural biological state are well cared for and their integrity is maintained and preserved so they're not subject to a violent existence or something of that kind and they're raised out of poverty and all of this. It seems to me the Humanity 2.0 agenda in some sense is going in a different direction from this and so there, it, there is, I don't think we should assume that the movement from Humanity 1.0 to Humanity 2.0 implies the Humanity 1.0 project's been completed. Okay? Uh, and in fact, I think that is the tricky political issue. The tricky political issue is the extent to which people who regard themselves as progressive, in the broad sense, in terms of being future-oriented, might start to abandon the Humanity 1.0 project in the sense of becoming less interested in, let's say, raising the poor out of poverty and ensuring that people live safe and secure existences, as, you know, and be more concerned, on the other hand, with opening up spaces that enable people to explore new horizons for themselves, whatever they may turn out to be. And I think that's kind of where the tricky political issue is here, that there's a sense in which there's a segment of humanity, and I think an increasing segment as the years go by, that will be very attractive to this transhumanist agenda, but it will involve, I think, in greater likelihood, an abandonment of the old Humanity 1.0 agenda. And I think that can lead to an interesting kind of political conflict with regard to what it means to be a progressive human being. Well, let's look at, let's put it this way. Um, I think if, if a Humanity 1.0 conception is very much enshrined in something like the welfare state, okay? So the welfare state, um, if you look at what the priorities are of the welfare state, it's to basically to make sure that all the people who are living in a society uh, have a certain amount of adequate existence, whether in terms of income, in terms of health care, education, food, security, and so forth. And the society is organized around making sure that that, as it were, minimally acceptable standard is maintained. And the way it will do it uh, is, of course, by increasing economic productivity and things of that kind, but also by redistributing wealth and in a sense putting constraints on the extent to which the people who let's say have the most or have the most capabilities are able to move forward in the society. So there is a very, uh, uh, you know, you might say a sort of egalitarian check on the way in which humanity can develop because there's an interest in having everyone develop, right, even if it means that the people who are at the front will have to develop a bit more slowly, okay. Um, and I think that's very much part of what has been uh, progressive, welfare state, broadly socialist thinking in the second half of the 20th century. Um, and I think it's that kind of mentality that is in fact very actively challenged by the sort of transhumanists. Because the transhumanists basically say, if there is a capability already there to go beyond a certain level, then it should be possible to explore those capabilities, even if at this point, we have yet to raise a significant level of the population up to the level of a humanity 1.0 decent existence. Well, I think one thing in terms of children are concerned. Um, I think children are much more open-minded to both a, a transhumanist and a post-humanist future. Um, and the reason is because, in a sense, if you look at the cartoons, if you look at the kinds of images that they're presented with, uh, in terms of movies, in terms of what they experience in their computer screens. Actually, children's environments are very much saturated with hybrid creatures, right, who can do all kinds of strange and crazy things, interacting with human beings as well, and having still recognizably human qualities. And so in that sense, a lot of the, a lot of the alien character of a transhuman or post-human future that a lot of people complain about, I think really only applies to the adult, the current adult generation but I think the children, who will be the adults of tomorrow, will in fact be quite used to these kinds of ways of seeing things, and, and these kinds of creatures as well. And you may know 
that, for example, in Japan, um, there is a kind of you know robotics museum that actually is very interactive, encouraging children to in fact play with androids and robots and things like that, and you know very much like uh, as you, you know interactive zoos have been in the past, and and you know because they want children to become acculturated to these android creatures being part of their normal life world as they become adults, and so I think in a sense the children aren't the problem here. I mean at the moment I think the problem are the adults and whether they're in fact open enough to enabling this future to happen. But I think the children are already mentally prepared for it.